Levi, what got you involved? Did David call you? Did you know each other? What, what, how did this incredibly good quality report get put together in such remarkably short time for all of New Zealand to read? How did you get involved, Levi? Um, well, <clears throat> I was, uh, you know, at the parliamentary protests. Um, and then after that, uh, we, um, well, I, I was told of a, um, uh, uh, an attempted occupation at the Marsden Oil Refinery because it was going to be closing on the 1st of April. So I got involved with that um, and that didn't go so swimmingly. So after that, I came away from it and I thought, well, you know, this is a really big issue because it is a massive issue. Um, it's a huge issue. And then um, I got involved with Operation Good Oil and through that, I met David and then um, David's been like um, researching and studying um, previous to uh, my involvement with him and then we thought well what are we going to do with all this information and we thought well the the most logical thing is to condense it into a, a summary report with all the facts and put it out there so that people are are aware of what's happening what is extraordinary about this report when I read it is the precision with which with which it is written. You really have pared back all the extraneous material and made it highly readable for all New Zealanders to get a hold of a copy and then understand the importance of Marsden Point to this country. This is what you say in the summary. Closure has led to across the board security threats that directly affect the safety and the well-being of every New Zealander. And I want to begin there, Levi, with you. Why should every New Zealander care? Kiwis are overwhelmed at the moment. The country's chaotic. Many of them have sick family members. Many have family members who are dying unexpectedly. There's a prime minister who doesn't seem to tell the country anymore any directives. She's saying, if you want to have, have uh, mandates, have mandates to the, the employers. People are feeling um, worried about their money and their jobs. And why should they take Marsden Point on? It's just one more thing that someone else can take care of, isn't it? Or is there a reason every Kiwi should care? Well, I think the, the first and foremost um, reason why we should all care about our fuel security is the fact that without fuel, we don't eat. Um, it's the way that the modern um, society has evolved. Um, all of our planting, all of our harvesting, all of our uh, food transport. Um, we're not just talking about the 91, the cost of 91 in your car to go to the beach on a Sunday. We're talking about without the diesel, we don't eat. Um, so the fact that we've had our, um, our means of production taken away from us, um, that's, that's a very serious concerning issue. Diesel, that's right, David, isn't it? Diesel is the main component in our agriculture. We can't run our tractors. Our farmers can't run their tractors without diesel being affordable and available. Yeah, and we, also we have no uh, food, food distribution as well. I mean, the people forget that, you know, um, the government is, is aligning this to a, a green deal, you could say, which is really inflammatory to, you know, the, all our processes that we, we basically, our, our country runs on diesel. It's, the, it's been one of the main outputs from uh, Marsden Point. Uh, diesel, uh, actually looking at the refin <coughs> excuse me, the refinery output figures, this is over a, a period of a year from April 2020 to March 2021. The refinery itself was putting out, this is a million litres, regular per oh, 1,146 million litres, premium diesel, uh, petrol, sorry, 306 million litres, but diesel alone, 1,969.73 million litres. That was a production that was coming out from Marsden Point in that one year. It makes no sense to me or any other Kiwi I've talked to, Levi, why, why a government would close down a refinery that is running such an efficient operation as that? What, what, is, what are the reasons they gave and what are the reasons you believe it's shutting this down or has shut it down? Well, the first, the first and foremost reason was given by the company that runs it, uh, refining, at that time it was refining New Zealand. Um, so they were saying that it was non-profitable and that they were running at a loss. Um, so it was a financial reason that was put forward initially. 
to the government, um, the government were given the option of subsidising the refining. Um, they turned it down and then they turned it into this, um, what they call a, uh, uh, a storage um, a storage only operation. So and they changed the name, didn't they, in April 2022? They changed the name as well. Was there a significance to that? Well, immediately after the closure of the refinery, uh, they changed the name from Refining New Zealand to Channel Infrastructure Limited. So I Do we know why, why that had to happen? Uh, well, I suppose it, it just goes in line with the fact that they're no longer refining and that they don't intend to do any refining ever again. Um, and they did some jigging around with the shares. Um, I'm not the best person to talk to about the shares. Carl Barkley, who couldn't, who's not with us today, he's the man to talk to about the shares. He's doing a lot of um, investigation into the shareholdings. And he's a third contributor to this report, The Good Oil, that people can get and read for themselves. Yes, he is, yes. So he's um, he's been uh, tracking, doing the nautical tracking, and he's been looking into the shareholdings and the business dealings and things like that. So, The one thing that stands out, David, very, very patently to all Kiwis is this. There was no consultation with the people about whether the people wanted their voted in representatives to shut down this national resource that has been going since when? 1962 it was begun, wasn't it? 1964 it officially opened. Uh, the, there, were, there was, no, there was no, no consultation given at all. There were uh, a shareholders meeting uh, that was proposed. And what I can remember from that is that Z Energy uh, prior to the actual shareholder, shareholder meeting and decision to close the refinery, had already opted to close it. So they, they were already, they already took the vote prior to the consultation. Consultation was never given to the public, never given an option for us to say, have any say in it. It was behind closed doors. Um, I do have the notes from the meetings and what went on and it was, yeah. What, what did go on? It's, it's just a hallmark of this government, this incredible arrogance, the lack of consultation with us and the behind closed doors meetings, and then the announcement of things that make a substantial impact on our lives. As far as I can see, April 2022, it was closed. The company was changed to Channel Infrastructure Limited, and the main shareholders were BP, Z Energy, and Exxon Exxon Mobil, is that right? And right. so these companies made this decision that would affect us, the Kiwis. Hmm. So it's important to note with the um, with Z Energy is that uh, immediately after the sale, or sorry, the closure of Refining New Zealand, they sold out to Ampol, which is an Australian oil company. Uh, and there were some dealings in there that Carl is more abreast of, but uh, there, there are rumours that um, one of the one of the, the um, conditions of the of the uh, takeover was that the refinery was closed. Um, that's a rumor, so I'm going to just put that out there. That that is a rumor, um, but there were some major shareholdings uh, that changed hands immediately after the closure. Could I ask our mainstream media stuff instead of going after local body politicians who are standing up with? the goodness of their heart, caring about Kiwi's democracy. Could you start investigating some of these stories like this one? What were the dealings? What happened? Why did they sell out to this Australian company? What were the conditions of that sellout? Why should New Zealanders be shafted? I mean, David, we are looking at something that supplied 70% of New Zealand's refined fuel needs, didn't, aren't we? That's what Marsden Point offered New Zealanders. It did, plus the employment as well. But with it, with it, we had security. I mean, it goes back to an audio file that I made earlier on this year, and which I read out quite a bit through the history of the refinery, where it actually added as a backstop for us with fuel security. And it was brought out that even back in 1973, at the start of the Yom Kippur War, where oil was $3 a barrel, it immediately jumped to $20 a barrel back then, that a uh, crude oil was becoming really um, insecure, but our backstop was that we had Marston Point, and that's what we had. And that was brought out further in further conversations with Catherine Bryan to Maritime as well, with Maritime New Zealand, that basically with, with the refinery, we have a certain level of security. Uh, if we, 
even if they were pushing to really stretch it in an, in an, in an emergency, and this was brought out on, 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 in an interview, that we could still make the percentage with our own indigenous fuel we have here, if we if take it as a, as a mix it with a, a heavier crude, that we could still retain at least maybe up to 10 or yeah, given a push, maybe the 20% that the country would need to keep the emergency services going, like ambulances, uh, fire services, police, uh, and food trucking. That was the biggest concern was trucks for food. So without margin point, uh, we have no backup. We have no backup. Uh, going, really going into that, bring you right up to today. Um, What's, what happened um, under the IEA, that's the International Energy Agency, uh, which is not a governing, it's not, it's not an elected body. Um, they actually, they wanted to know the figures of what stock only we have around the country. Now I have detailed maps uh, showing every port around the country, there's 11 ports, where how much stock holding is, it can be held there. But it's always been unknown as to our stock holding uh, volumes. And I've looked through every Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment uh, document that I can find on fuel, and there is no stock holding listed. It's absolutely shocking. And even recently, as of recent, Megan Woods, the Ministry, Energy Ministry, uh, they wrote another mandate, and it's an on government legislation website, you'll find it there. They, they've mandated the oil companies report their stock holdings. It's not quite law yet, but then again, in a, in a double speech, she's actually forbidden the public to have knowledge about what's actually in the stock. For the stock. Oh, they are, they are the limit, this government. So she said, we must have reporting of holdings, but the public mustn't yep. know. Yep, and not. before that, you were making the point that there are 11 storage areas for our fuel supplies in New Zealand, but we don't know what's in them. Yeah. We don't know what our what our fuel security. Oh. Le Levi, can I come to you? That basically means that this country is totally dependent now with the shutting of Marsden Point. It's totally dependent on ships coming in from offshore for our fuel supply to keep us going. Is that right? Absolutely, yes. So, what kind of an insane governmental decision <laughs> would do that? Would leave us that vulnerable? Well, it I makes no that... sense. On the surface of it, it's um, it's being presented as a, uh, a move away from what they term a single point of failure, um, which is what they call the refinery. Um, but we already had a mix of refining. So we had a mix of crude and refined fuels coming in already because we had 30% of our fuels that were coming in were, were uh, refined fuels. So we had some petrols and um, various things coming in. So they've basically taken one production stream out or one supply stream out and then said it, it, it's the emperor's new clothes you know they're, they're convincing everybody that up is down down is up mm -hmm. um, i mean how does taking out um uh, an, a production a means of production how is that making your supply more secure it's not so um whether whether it's got to do with the fuel companies trying to make more money through saving money, getting the, the fuel refined in cheaper markets in um, Singapore and South Korea, where they could be dodging things like carbon emissions trading taxes, um, and it's cheaper for them to ship it here, or whether it's something much deeper. Um, I'm going to leave that up to the people of New Zealand to decide, um, but the facts are pretty, pretty um, evident here um, that that we're not being told the truth, the full story. David, what is our vulnerability with ships coming in? Could, for example, I know that uh, owners of these big oil tankers, they're constantly on, on, on apps and more sophisticated electronic uh, updates to see where the best price will be for selling that tank load of oil, aren't they? So if, if a ship was on its way here, someone told me potentially they could go, no, divert from New Zealand, I can get a much better price I don't know, in Australia or, or Singapore, divert up. We are, we are that vulnerable, are we not? Ships might come, but they might not. That has actually already happened. There was a ship, a ship on its way from China uh, with finished fuel, it's called finished fuel, uh, that turned uh, halfway, it, it diverted off to another country. 
and that was actually reported, I think it was News Hub that came on and said that, it was actually reported on mainstream media. No one batted an eyelid. It's and absolutely it make, shocking. It didn't, make, didn't seem to make any sense. that the, 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 I actually reported on that uh, part of the, that announcement that they actually made an extra $3 million profit by not delivering the fuel. Um, it's how but it, the point of it, too, is, I mean, apart from the greed that we're now vulnerable to, the point is that we could be totally dependent on this tanker as the world's fuel supplies get more and more shake, shaky. And that crucial tanker supply might not land. We are as vulnerable as that. That's how this Labour government has now positioned New Zealand. Am I right there? Yeah, certainly. The, we, I started tracking tankers back in March. Uh, when, you know, March, April, when I found that that, that that was going to be the last shipment of crude, I started using a, an app called Maritime Vessel. Um, it clearly shows, I, I, tra I tracked the, the amount of ships that were coming in and around the country. Carl jumped on this, now Carl took it over from me. I've gotten back into it. I built a database just for shipping in New Zealand uh, for the amounts of ship, the amount of tankers that come in. I took note, uh, took notes of their, their weight, their length, their width, and their draft. That could, that gave me a calculation of, you know, 49,000 uh, tons of of liquid fuel there. What they what we couldn't find out was the uh, what uh, quality it was and what was the distribution. Was it petrol, diesel, jet fuel? Was it other products? Other tankers we could note were Asheville tankers and L L LPG tankers also. That was, so we kept a track on those. What was the real worry was the quality of the fuel that was coming in, and that was also brought up by Maritime and the uh, Radio New Zealand at the time as well. Basically, we, our output from Marsden Point was the highest quality. It was perfect for our, for our roads and our trucks and our vehicles. Trouble is, with the, the, the refined fuels that's, that's already coming in, we can't tell the quality, uh, and any any ship that's not up to that quality would need to be sent off to be refined again in Australia and then brought back into the country. I mean, Oh, my that, goodness. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's, it just it gets worse the more it gets worse the d the deeper we dig. Yeah. Yeah, Levi, so we could be getting fuel that is mixed with very substandard yeah. quality material to make it go further, but goodness knows what could be being injected into the air from this supposedly terribly green government of Labour Greens. Is that right, Levi? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we've got no. Uh, I mean, obviously they've put standards for our fuel, um, but there's no control over how it's manufactured when it's made offshore. Basically, we're buying imported product now. Um, and who's testing it? I don't know. Um, but it's like anything else. If they put it on the ship and they send it here and it's not up to spec, well, what do you do? You send it back, don't you? The more I investigate this government, I'm going to be frank with you, the more things seem to point to a government that is working absolutely against the interests of the people of New Zealand, a government that seems to want chaos, disorder, breaking down of systems that we had running very efficiently. It is a most disillusioning picture the more I do these interviews. It's really worrying. And our fuel supply is at the heart of the efficient running of our businesses in New Zealand, isn't it, Levi? As you Absolutely. said earlier, um, they've thrown us back. Um, they've thrown us back to before the time when we had a refinery, um, and you know, if you look at the regression that's happening, we've got no refinery, we've got war, we've got embargoes. Um, it's only a matter of time before we're going to end up in the situation where they're going to say, "Oh, look, there's a crisis," um, and it's going to. That's the reason why we've put this report out there is because we we want people to understand that this hasn't just happened overnight. You know, this is not a crisis that's suddenly come upon us. Um, this has been in the making for the last couple of years. Um, and if I was a conspiracy theorist, I would be looking very deeply at the um, fact that the 1981 um, petroleum demand, hold the phone, let me just pull this up. Um, after the last uh, shortage, when we had Carlos Days here, Back in 1981, the 
New Zealand Parliament created a piece of legislation which is called the Petroleum Demand Restraints Act or Restraint Act. Now that piece of legislation was never taken off the books and coincidentally it was updated in 2021 which was a year prior to the closure of the refinery. Now I'd also point to the fact that the IEA, the International Energy Association, had stated that there were already problems globally with refining and diesel shortages. So if one was to be um, a little In, bit- Intelligently <laughs> questioning, which is what I think a conspiracy theorist is, if one was to be intelligently, critically thinking, I think conspiracy theory is a compliment now. What would one be asking, Levi? Oh, me? Um, well, I'd be asking, why did they update that, um, that petroleum um, restraints act and, and why did they close the refinery when they knew darn well that there was a, um, a global shortage of refineries and that there was a diesel shortage looming on the, on the horizon? Why? It goes against all um, fiduciary responsibility. It's, it goes beyond mismanagement. Um, and the fact that we can see here on at least two occasions, the minister, Megan Woods, um, directly contradicted the consultant reports that she had on her desk, um, I would be asking some serious questions. We'll get to Megan Woods. I've noted some of those in the report, some of her um, answers on morning report. Um, she seems to be lining up to take on Jacinda Ardern's title of most lies to New Zealanders. Let's go back though first to the Independent Energy Association, IEA. I did not realize is that another of these private organizations like the World Economic Forum, or we've just found out about the Federation of State Medical Boards that rules over doctors that nobody, that no, very few doctors know about, and almost nobody in the world knows about, but they issue directives to all the councils, like our medical council or, or medical boards around the world. So what is this? Independent Energy Association. This is another one of these private groups that has inordinate power in, in the world situation. Is that right? Yeah, Could you the, tell me a bit about that? Yeah, they're a lot like uh, the, World Economic, e e the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization. They're basically they're an organization. That I'll, I'll actually bring up the document in here. We know that the World Health Organization is totally captured by the Gates Foundation. Yeah. It's the biggest funder of the World Health Organization, and it was the WHO that declared everything a pandemic. And that goes back to one man declaring, basically, forcing the, this private organization to say there's a pandemic. And then that same man benefited enormously from his investments in big pharmaceutical companies from the rollout of the jab. That was the Gates Foundation at both ends of that. So what have we got with the energy cycle here with the private organization? Can you, can you elaborate for us? Yeah, um, okay, I'll, the documents are going to uh, just turn over and quote. You'll see where this is all going to come to. This is, this is what we found out. If you take the fuel industry regulations, regulations 2021, take that there, the Petroleum Demand Restraint Act 1981, again, version 2021, and the International Energy Agreement Act 1976, again, version 28, 28th October 2021. This you will find in a massive document called the National Fuel Plan that was published March 2020. And again, uh, the minister's in there. It's called the National Emergency Management Agency. That's where the prior document titles all come into this new one here. They quote from every other document that I've just read out here to you. This one is a uh, disturbing. Um, Who's this put together by? This uh, National Emergency, this is Civil Defence. Civil Defence. But I wanted to find out about this independent organisation that, that seems to be <coughs> having sway over our energy policy in New Zealand. What is this an international energy authority? Tell us a bit more about that. Okay, uh, under, under the guidelines, or quote guidelines, uh, the IEA recommended that New Zealand, like other countries as well, 
opt in to a storage plan where we could have backup fuel security. New Zealand did have 90 days of uh, fuel. You know, it was, they're the ones that lay out the plan. Uh, so New Zealand agreed to 90 days storage. Uh, however, that storage could be, you now this is paper tickets again come into play here. We found out that storage was actually stored in 30 days or most of the fuel was actually stored in Spain and it wasn't actually physical storage. Uh, it was like having paper gold. And also that the storage could be also, storage that could be included could also uh, be tankers that were on the way here, but not yet docked. That Which could, means it's not stored. It's not stored. There's nothing is as it seems, <laughs> Levi. It's just, it's real, it's real smoke and mirrors. That's what this government seems to be offering Kiwis. So, so what, who is, who is in this international organization? Levi, what did your, uh, what did your research throw up? Uh, well, I haven't really looked into them too much. Um, I just know that they're an international, or they call themselves the International Energy Organ uh, Association. Um, I think there's around 40 countries in it, uh, 31 membership and eight, eight associates, so 39 countries, I think, that are in there. Um, basically, they've just, it's all those countries have come together and made an agreement. It's a bit like an OPEC type setup. Um, and I think it's got a lot to do with the um, the countries that uh, the, the wealthy countries. You know, mm. so they've all said, okay, well, we've 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 all got barrels of oil and whatnot. So you know, this is what we're going to sign up to. Um, and to be honest with you, most of this stuff's been pretty darn good. Um, it's pretty common sense, normal stuff. But like everything else, it's started to deteriorate over the last. Um, decade or so and now they're talking about solar and wind and all this other nonsense and um there's really no kind of teeth to anything they say so if they say oh you've got a whole 90 days supply um then the government says yeah that's a nice rule but we're not going to and they sell off their their um oil to artificially inflate the or deflate the price of oil to flood the market with our with our reserve oil so um yeah um they're pretty much um Pretty much a toothless organization that requires people uh, voluntarily um, following the rules i guess you could say all right well let's take it back now to why this marsden oil refinery was built and what the idea was behind it in 1962 this public private partnership was formed to be able to build this refinery for the people of new zealand and even then, taxpayers invested billions, and that would have been a lot. Over the years, we've invested billions, haven't we? I think there was an upgrade in 1986, 1980 to 86, of $1.84 billion. So in the 80s, a billion dollars was a lot of money. And it was run, as you said earlier, by the Refining NZ Limited, which was a limited liability company. So what, what was its purpose and, and what was the idea behind it as a as something to be treasured by all generations of Kiwis. Can you tell us a bit about that, Levi? Well the sole purpose of the um, refinery was uh, it was a it was it was envisioned and and constructed as a strategic asset. Um, you know, because the country that could make its own its own energy, its own fuel supply, um, it's independent. So, you know, we've got oil here. Um, I, the original vision, as I understand it, was that we would be able to, um, in a stitch, refine our own oil. Um, that's pretty much was the sole purpose of it. Um, but, you know, as a bonus, uh, we could buy oil offshore and bring it in and refine it as well. So, um, you know, it just made more sense. And then... David, the infrastructure that we've developed there was, was good quality infrastructure, I understand, but has been since decimated. Have There were rumours that the pipes were being filled by this government, were even being filled with concrete so that it could never be reopened by a future government. When they decided to close this down and stymie it, they were going to do a good and proper job. Have they done that, as far as you're aware, put concrete into the pipes? I, I did hear that, although I, I couldn't prove that. Uh, what I did pick up from the China Infrastructure website, they actually got it quite detailed in there, the, the decommissioning and take down off the plan. And uh, they've got that quite well noted in their, on their website, which is, you know, that is good. 
good at least they at least they're coming forward with it. Uh, I mean, it's not a, it's not all a sad loss. I I did find other engineers' uh, reports and listened to them as well through video that in a major turnaround, when when a refinery reaches a certain age, they will put it into what what they call turnaround, where they will strip it back and say it takes between eighteen months to twenty four months to actually strip a re refinery down, make sure it's all okay, do whatever repairs, replace any parts. Uh, to turn that refinery around and make it workable again. So I am not at the sort of stage where I'm going to like throw everything away just now and say we've lost the plant. I think I think once this gets out and we get enough people behind us, and uh, most people most people can see what's been going on, that we still might have the chance to get this refinery back up and running in New Zealand hands. That is really hopeful. That's the most hopeful thing I've heard. So do you agree with that, Levi, that it could be salvageable, even, oh, with, even yeah, with what this government's done? Yeah, anything's possible. Um, you know, we built it in the first place. Uh, if we wanted to build a more modern, um, much more efficient refinery, we could probably do that as well. Um, you know, the one thing about New Zealanders, and this is um, why I have such hope for this country, is that if you put us in a, in a hard situation, we'll find a way out of it. Mm. Um, it's just the way that we are. I mean, we've got um, brilliant engineers, we've got brilliant electrical engineers, we've got, you know, brilliant workshops in this country. Um, you know, we've got coal, we've got oil. Um, if we so desired, we could have a, a refinery up and running within a matter of months. That's a really... That's a really wonderful thing to say. And I, I know this is an aside, but in the Freedom Village, you ran, you had a big part to play in running the, the free food that went out day in, day out for those 23 days, didn't you, Levi? Yeah, I had a little bit to do with it. You had a lot. I just, I just underline this. Kiwis, Kiwis also had a lot to, to, to do towards that. We had the farmers who turned up with huge sides of, of beef and, and, and meat. We had all the farmers and, and food growers who supplied free food. There were people who supplied fridges, weren't there? Were you amazed at the, at the ingenuity of Kiwis and the way that came together almost, I say effortlessly, but with a lot of work behind the scenes, but almost effortlessly, Kiwis chipped in and made something work so beautifully, so quickly. Did it surprise you? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, the only way I could, I could describe it is that there was just a spirit of ingenuity that was happening, you know, and people were just making things happen and just the, the amount of, um, uh, like aroha and love and, and togetherness that, that, um, uh, brought this, this whole spirit of like, you know, we can do anything, you know, we can make anything happen and it just happened. You know, if we needed something someone would say hey we need something and within minutes it was there you know um incredible and, and it's like people were busting out the tools and building stuff and you know um little old ladies were bringing little bags of um cucumbers that they'd grown in their garden you know and then another guy would turn up with a big trailer load full of stuff and it was just you know if we pull together then anything's possible i said yesterday in an interview to someone it was a river of love it wasn't a river of filth. What was looking over us from Parliament was the river of filth. But that's an aside. It's a relevant aside, however, because you're, you're both saying the same thing could happen with reinvigorating this refinery. Do not give up on it, Kiwis. Yep. Would that be your message, David? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We do have, we do have uh, Indigenous oil here, and we have enough. It's also been brought up in other reports as well when they say, you know, we don't have the oil here. We do. We have massive basins of oil, enough to keep us going, uh, and it is of a good quality. It, it's sweet like crude. Now that's what Americans call Texas gold, sweet like crude, and that's the oil we have here. Why would we bring in bunkered heavy, heavy crude to refine? And at the same time, we just taking it from that year again. Uh, I'll just look at this paper here: Indigenous production crude oil consolidate and that naphtha sorry, 1,192 million litres produced in one year from New Zealand's oil fields. From L New Zealand? LPG, 289 million litres. The export 
1,115.75 uh, million litres exported out of New Zealand. And what's happened to that with the closure of the refinery? It's still running. Um, it's still running? Uh, as far as... As far as we can tell on the maps, uh, well, I do. I actually do it every day. I always check my maritime maps to see what ships are coming in, where they're dropping off, how long they've been staying in the country for. Although, as again, we can't say what type of fuel they have. Uh, we don't. It's, you know, it's going to be a guess on the map, but they there is in South Taranaki Blight, right in the middle. Uh, there's a production platform sitting in there. It's called the storage tank. Um, but we think it's a lot more than that because I've seen ships coming in there and disappearing again. So wait a minute, just <laughs> let me get this clear. So Thanks we are time. producing New Zealand yep. oil, yep. but that is being taken offshore yep. and we are importing second rate oil. Yep, yep. We're, we're importing uh, a fuel that's got no guarantee that the next flight that you take, it might be the last one because we don't know how good the jet A1 fuel is. Um, there is, there's a, is some <coughs> fuel authority there. I have seen it noted and I did look. But uh, really, I mean, it is so impractical. These people can't be checking every tank of fuel that comes into this country. It's just, that is just nonsense. Mm. Um, Levi, am I missing something here? <laughs> Wouldn't we just get our oil mm. and bring it onshore for Kiwis to use, given that there is a crisis, an energy crisis happening to make sure our wonderful farmers have fuel security, our trucks for delivering food have fuel security, and our people who need to get around in New Zealand have fuel security. Why don't we stop exporting our beautiful quality oil and use it ourselves? Could you explain that, Levi? Um, once again, the only um, logical conclusion I can draw um, takes us over into the realms of conspiracy theory again, um, because I can't think of any logical reason why you wouldn't um, want to exploit your own resources, other than there are those that don't want us to, perhaps because it would make us too self-sufficient. I don't know. My God, we... The the, you know, the Kiwis that I talk to more and more are saying we do not need central government. They are so incompetent. Regime after regime after regime, they enrich their own nests, they ignore the voices of the people, and they can't seem to, to run anything. You know, the great Kiwi saying they couldn't organise a piss up in a brewery. They yeah. just right. seem utterly incompetent. Can I just speak into that? Um, I don't think it is incompetence, um, especially when you look at the Minister Megan Woods. Um, you know, she's, she's, she's got a PhD in history. Um, she's run, uh, she's CEO'd companies. I don't think that she can hide behind incompetence over this. Um, I don't think anybody's that incompetent. So uh, incompetence is the excuse. Um, I think what we as Kiwis need to do is stop allowing them to hide behind that and, you know, start to hold them accountable for their fiduciary responsibilities. Thank you, Levi. And, and for people who now want to arm themselves with more facts, where would you recommend they go? I mean, obviously, for me, the Good Oil Report, we will attach it underneath this interview. People can then download copies of that. And it's got lots of papers at the end that people can read. Where else would you suggest people start investigating and self-educating? Um, look, there's other sites out there. Um, there's the uh, the Secure Marsden um, refinery that, I th it's, sorry, it's, I put it there. It's at the end of the report. It's securemarsden.com, I think it is. People can refer to the report, perhaps. Yeah, Don't yeah. worry, Levi. Save, will... uh, SaveMarsdenPoint.com. Um, yes. There's other organisations out there, like the Dig In at Marsden crew. They're doing some stuff there. They might have some stuff on their website. I haven't really checked that out too much. Um, but, you know, look, um, just follow the breadcrumbs. Yep, that's um, what we have to do. And yeah. I think now we do have to tackle the issue of Megan Woods. Um, there are a number of references to her in your Good Oil report. It's pretty horrifying. There's clear evidence that she is not telling the truth. That's what I'll say. So there was this Hale and Toomey report saying um, there, were, there are such concerns about imported finished fuel uh, one of the, the things they say in their report is uh, it could, this could have a significant impact on New Zealand's fuel security. And yeah. yet, countering that, a spokesperson for Megan Woods, 
on Radio New Zealand, and you quote John, quote this spokesperson on the 2nd of June, 2021, uh, and Megan Woods is the energy minister, remember, um, said, oh no, it's not expected to have a significant impact on fuel security. So on that day, we have a direct contradiction from the Hale and Toomey report, which had really gone into it. And you point out further on in your report, David, that she had a, they have no qualification to contradict the people who are investigating, do they? They are not deeply imbued with knowledge on energy or fuel security, these ministers and their representatives. As, you know, I agree with what Levi says, they're pretty incompetent really when it comes to it. I mean, Kaylin Toomey, I have put out quite a numerous reports over the years. They, they are consultants and advisors to the government uh, on our fuel supply. You know, they're, they're, they're the ones that when, when they say we've got a problem, we should listen, you know. And the... instead we have a minister and her representatives just ignoring it, flicking yep. it off. Yep, they gave ample warning for the reports. They, they, sorry, I'll just grab the folder. I'll, ch I'll just get the date, make sure I've got the date correct. I sure it was March 2020, the first report uh, that I came on. I got these through listening to the interviews from Catherine Ryan. Uh, refining New Zealand impact to conversion conversion to fuels terminal. That was the first concern, and that was back 23rd of March 2020. Uh, they had ample time. And the, another report, a 50-odd page report came out after that as well. Uh, other major, major, major mind-blowing concerns that they were telling the government, look, this is a bad idea. You don't want to do this. It's yeah, incredible. Right. And, and, it's, yep. and then we have Megan Woods, Levi, saying um, entirely incorrect in assertions made on Radio New Zealand on the 31st of March of this year. Tell us about this. This is, I think David referred to it earlier, about light, New Zealand's light crude cannot be refined apparently at Marsden Point under emergency conditions. Oh, yes. this, is, this, is what, this is what was maintained yes, by yes. our energy minister. Yeah, so Megan Woods um, told Radio New Zealand that we couldn't refine our light crude oil here without mixing it with um, sour from overseas, sour crude. And then when she was pressed on it, could we even get the three to 5%, um, she said, no, you can't do it basically. So Simon Terry from the uh, um, from Sustainability Council, um, he was, uh, he was um, interviewed again uh, by Nine Till Noon, by the Nine Till Noon program on RNZ. And he basically came out and said, she's full of it. Um, so the, That she's lying. It's an well, absolute uh, lie. Well, his words were he can't account for why the minister got it wrong, um, but she had it absolutely 180 degrees wrong. Um, mm. So, you know, whether she's lying or whether she's hiding, well, as I said, I don't believe that she's that incompetent. I really don't. Mm. Um, that, that would just be her cop-out. Um, you know, the first cop-out is incompetence, and then further in the report, the reason why we alluded to the global warming is because of the climate change is because the next line of defence will be climate change. Um, but it's quite evident to me that she's she's poor, full of porkies. There's a large section of the report dealing with the carbon neutral agenda. Could you just introduce us to some of the ideas in there, Levi? Um, yeah, well, basically it's um, just, you know, the, the facts that, that the, the government has signed New Zealand up to the, par uh, sorry, to the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Um, and then again, to the Paris Accord. Um, which is to reduce heavily reduce carbon emissions by 2030 and then to have carbon zero by 2050. Um, and, and this government signed us up with no discussion with us about what it meant to Agenda 2030. For anybody who isn't aware of that, you can look it up under the World Economic Forum and it will make your, your hair stand on end what this government has signed New Zealand up to. Yeah. But let's get back to this. So it, it signed us up to the Kyoto Protocol. And yeah. what does that mean for Kiwis um, who haven't yet looked at that? Well, well, under the Paris Accord, um, it's that they've all agreed that that the the, uh, the ratifying or the signatory countries are going to be carbon zero by 2050. Um, so basically, that means that um, these countries are supposed to be um, producing less carbon than what they sequester. Um, so really, it means that nobody's going to have a car. Um, you know, 
farming is going to be pretty much a thing of the past, according to them. Um, yeah, so really, I mean, it, what it means is that 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 they have pro most likely used that as the as their main excuse for letting the refinery go. That's what I believe anyway, because we see breadcrumbs of that. And beyond that, it's an excuse for manipulating populations, for doing what they did in COVID, um, dictating to populations, using fear mongering to fill the population with fear so that they can they can submit to a government that isn't listening to the people. Is, is for either of you, uh, do you see parallels with the rollout of the COVID fear response, I'm going to call it, and the climate change fear response from these governments. For me, there was perhaps a, 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 an infection going around. It might have been the winter flu. Who knows? There was something that was going around. They then hyped that up and got everybody really scared about a problem. And then they offered this solution, which was the one way, the jab. And it seems to me, we, we do on climate, we need cleaner air, always. We need cleaner waterways. That's something that's a given. We can always do better. We need better management of land and that's not planting pine trees everywhere. But what they're doing is then flipping it and scaring, especially our young. Some young are apparently so depressed about their future because of all this climate change fear porn that's like the COVID fear porn that didn't in the end ring true. There are parallels. To me, it seems like a way to manipulate and uh, herd populations. Does that resonate with either of you? Yeah, uh, with me, yes. Uh, part of this comes out in the National Fuel Plan, believe it or not, and especially concerning part two. Now, I'm going to go back to what you were saying there. Part B, response to a fuel disruption or emergency. Now, right here, here other document, uh, late December 2020. Uh, this is Ministry of Business again. And this is dealing with progress, progressing a sustainable transport biofuel mandate. This is all part of the green evolution that they're moving towards. It's tied up with 2030 and 2050 again. They're all moving in here. Yeah, so I agree with what you say. I mean, Marston Point, could it, could, was it taken down deliberately? Yeah, because it makes us vulnerable, you know. Mm. And fear, fear, fear is a virus. You know, mm. and this, this, this again, this, this is what's happening again. So I could see, you know, it was taken down for a reason. It's to put us in the spot. We become reliant again on the government handouts. If we get fuel shortages, uh, the government in these documents I've got here have already relaxed, relaxed the road rules for truck drivers. They no longer need log books. They don't need to keep a log. They're not restricted. They don't need to turn down their engines for braking. They for you know, do the en engine braking. Uh, really? Yep. They've got no time limits on driving, so they don't need to keep a little book. They've got no time limits for rest and stuff like that for operations, and also there's no speed limit. Why would the government do that? Or have done that? They've got it in here. They've, that that is the other bit. Some of the bits, some parts we didn't include in the report because they're just too out there just now. No Such one. as put put it here, David. Exactly like that. The food restrictions where basically, if you've seen out in your car, okay, you'll be contribute contributing. Sorry, I've got a missing tooth and keeps doing it. You will you could be seen to be a contributor of the emergency fuel emergency process. So you think you're going to go around and buy petrol? No, you're contributing to the emergency. We need that for military service vehicles and, and the rest. This gets Levi to your idea that they could suddenly call a new version of a pandemic, a crisis, a climate crisis, and we have to bring in these strict rules for New Zealanders, rules that in effect will cause a kind of de facto lockdown because yeah. nobody will be able to go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's um, don't need a climate crisis, you just need a fuel crisis. And the, and the only way, uh, sorry, the, the, the easiest way to get a fuel crisis in New Zealand now is to, um, stop a ship coming and uh, it's not you know <laughs> you, you get um you get a late shipment and then um we believe um i'll just put this number out there this is only a it, it's an educated guess but we believe that we only have somewhere between 11 to 14 days worth of fuel in the country 
um, and it takes about 18 days to get a ship down here. So if a ship was running four days late, um, then we would immediately be on the red line. And, um, you know, what's, what happens when a ship runs 10 days late, then you're going to have a deficit. So the only way to um, solve the deficit is to ration the fuel usage. Um, so, this uh, is half, absolutely you know, horrific. Sorry, yeah. Levi, what were you saying there? I'm just saying it's not hard to generate a crisis now. And then as David's rightly pointed out, the legislation's all in place. Um, the, what he hasn't yet said is that the, um, that particular uh, emergency fuel plan is uh, policed by an organisation called NEMA. Now, NEMA is the National Emergency Management Agency, and it is um, answerable directly to the Prime Minister's office. So it's an agency of the Prime Minister's office. So under a national fuel emergency, NEMA takes over, and guess who's the chief of NEMA? Who? Jacinda. <laughs> or whoever the sitting prime minister is at the time. And when was NEMA formed? Uh, NEMA's been around since... Um, David, you got that one? I think I first heard of them back in about 2020, like 2019, 2020. I think, uh, well, this came out in March 2020. Uh, March 2020, yeah. Yeah, there this is, is, I mean, you, you refer with a wry eye to conspiracy theories, and I say, no, they're conspiracy theorists are people who have critical thinking faculties. But I had one tell me, if you want to wreak utter havoc in a country, you create fuel shortages, so the farmers can't run their tractors, so the food can't be grown, and then the trucks can't bring the food into the city, so there are food shortages. So there's rioting in the streets and then this same government that has caused all of this mayhem and this utter chaos in a society and insecurity and stress and worry rides in and says, don't worry, guys, we've got a universal basic income. And as long as you sign up and you do everything we want, just like in China with the social credit system and you are monitored day and night and we have passports like we had in the, in the jab rollouts, as long as you do all that, you're allowed to go on public transport. You won't be allowed to drive your cars. You can get the food you want locally, but we have basically, in effect, total control over you. And when that person told me that, I went, oh, that's far too far. They've gone too far now. And now, as you explain this, we can see how the pieces of a very dark puzzle could be put into place along those lines. I'll leave that there for Kiwis to say, could it be true? Could it not be true? I don't know. I haven't been able to get the research myself. You guys have done a terrific job with this, and it's a piece of the puzzle. We now need to, to move to what Kiwis who are watching this and starting to feel, as I am, rising panic. What can Kiwis do to turn this around against this tiny group? We are many. They are few. They are vastly overreaching what we ever voted them in to do. All of us are waiting to get them out in 2023. But what can we do in the meantime? I want to start with you, David. I think once once this gets out, and as Levi, Levi, Levi and I were discussing the other day, there was a lot more we could have put in here. We could have written a book about this, but really it would have been just pointless. So what we agreed was we just get this out. You know, once this gets released to the public, we'll take the feedback. And I think that's where, you know, we can start to release release more information. We will give people the links to all of these documents that we have here, and there's a lot that's gone into this. Uh, we will give these we will give we will give these links out, and I think that w once people start to see that, then they will start to question it themselves. I think that's when we can maybe get a better end result as to okay, I can't make the decisions myself, neither can Levi. You know, I think we'll leave it up to the people in New Zealand to say look. Where do we want to where do we want to go with this from here? What do we need to do and get their collective ideas together? Let's talk, let's have meetings, you know, let's let's put up a show you honestly what's our plan of action because we need to do something quick. We haven't got the time to sit around, you know. Absolutely. And and at the very least, Megan Woods doesn't lie in in private anymore. She lies and we have a lot of New Zealand eyeballs on her. Mm. Levi, what is your suggestion for what Kiwis can do now? Um, well, my suggestion is uh, don't um, take it lying down. Um, you know, uh, in, in section um, four of our report, you know, we've put in a, just a brief mention, um, thanks to Carl, thanks Carl, um, who 
wanted to bring up the you know the New Zealand the New Zealand dollar dropping against the US, um, the fact that the oil reserves are being depleted, um, but also I um, I I want to just also bring forward to New Zealand that globally we're responsible for own for less than one percent of greenhouse gas emissions. So the closing of our refinery, the taking away of our um, our our vehicles, our diesel and that, um, in my opinion, and I'm not a legal expert, but in my opinion, um, the measures that are being hoisted upon us are disproportionate to our contribution um, to uh, global uh, warming or global gas greenhouse emissions. So in saying that, um, when we start to see these huge petrol prices and diesel prices, which are about to come on us when this Manipula artificial manipulation of the oil market ends. Um, I would like to just really strongly say to all the um, all the trucking associations, all the um, transport unions, um, farmers unions, all you guys, start thinking seriously about high court action. Start thinking seriously about civil disobedience. Start thinking seriously about, um, in conjunction with that high court action, stop paying your road user charges. You know, stop paying your GST. Um, let's start to um, let's start to get together and make a uh, make ourselves known to these. We have to stand up. We Would have it? to stand up. We have got one more year to tolerate of this unbearable government, and they have done so much damage in a year. So, in another year, what could they wreak? Unless we stand up and stand together as a people. David, on that road user issue, you were mentioning right at the beginning bitumen. What's the implication of the closing of this refinery on our bitumen for our roads? Um, New Zealand Transport Agency were just beyond themselves. They, they, the quality of the bitumen that's coming in has already been seen when it comes to the new road like uh, Transmission Gully. I, I have just heard, I haven't driven up there, but I've just heard this from a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of comments as well that are getting banded about that the, the road is just, it's, it's gone. You know, they're, they're now using what they call, it's an emulsion because they can't get the bitumen. And so they're using some sort of emulsion there to make up for the loss of the bitumen asphalt. And it's an emulsion is just a mixture, isn't it? A yep. mixture of things. So they're using second grade material, but yep. why is bitumen so implicated with Marsden Point being able to be operative? Um, Marsden, well, that, uh, that was a byproduct that came mm. in. Uh, the catalytic converter that was the that was the part of a byproduct which we needed for for Asheville, you know which we need for our roads and the quality again it's down to a uh, quantity and quality and the times of deliveries and all my records i only just picked up another Asheville tanker yesterday and that was like wow and all the tanker records i've got since march i've only got another one just now with what's happened to the What's happened? We don't know, you know. David, could you make sure that all that material is properly backed up and that it's stored elsewhere as well as in your house? Because I'm also getting reports of this government sending police, I can only call them mm. police thugs, in to um, take material that New Zealanders have carefully compiled on their own time and on yeah. their own dime and taking that, that. And it seems, again, something that one would see in a movie of a bad illicit government, but it's happening here. And I would like to know that all your material is backed up and put somewhere else as well. Could you do that for all of us? Yeah. These records yeah. you're keeping are yeah. crucial historical records as well. And I just cannot thank you enough on behalf of all of us who care about New Zealand for the work you're doing. It's extraordinary. All can, I just say, can I just say, if you're, if you're watching um, New Zealand Police, SIS, GCSB, um, all of these records are public uh, matter of public record yes we've backed them up uh, Good. Numerous times and they're all over the country so you know there's no point rating poor old david um the stuff's on the internet so oh that's brilliant that yeah. really that really gives me a relief I, I, because i mean one of the things when we get a new government is we're going to have to weed out those sections of police who are acting illicitly i know there are still good decent police i've talked to them and they're uncomfortable with what's going on under this government but there are some who are willing to transgress proper human rights and proper human standards and proper ethical standards for a government that is no longer respected by the people. And those police will be answerable in the end for what they're doing. 
Um, that's an aside. Talking about personnel, Levi, one of the things when I heard about the closure of the refinery, my heart just went out to all those wonderful refinery workers who have, who have given many of them life, a lifetime of good service to this important facility for New Zealand. And they were out of jobs. Do you know how they are faring? Um, that's really not something I would know um, because I don't really personally know anybody that was affected adversely from the closure. Uh, mm. But I do understand that uh, a lot of them have found work um, elsewhere, um, you know, because they are, they are in an industry that um, continues to pump along. Um, not so good for the Northland economy. Um, they've lost, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars out of that local economy. Um, that's also something that I was looking into the other day. Um, the, the conditions of their resource consent to carry on operations there uh, with the local, um, the local iwi or the local tribes, local hapu, um, they, one of the reasons why they granted them the consent to carry on for the next 10 or 20 years, I can't remember exactly how much, was the fact that they were such big input and employers in the local community. So these guys got their consent reissued in um, 2021, I think. And then within months of that, they turned around and shut the plant down and fired everybody. So, <laughs> um, I mean, that's just the kind of people we're dealing with here. You know, these people are, have got no morals, no ethics. They're totally narcissistic. And um, they don't actually care about you or I. Um, all they care about is making money. I was going to say, when you have a government that no longer cares about the people, which we saw on March the 2nd, 2022, in the Freedom Village, that no longer values its own people, you have tyrant, tyrants, you have tyranny in the country. I'm going to go back to that paragraph I began with. It's from your summary. Closure of Marsden Point has led to across-the-board security threats that directly affect the safety and well-being of every New Zealander. I would beg every New Zealander to get hold of your report. And on that note, Levi, how do they get the report and how much does it cost? What, what, what are the, what's the way they can do it? Oh, the report's free. <laughs> yeah, no, we've, um, the, wow. this, we've, we've um, you know, uh, done this for the, for the people. Um, so the report's absolutely free. Um, you can go to operationgoodoil.co.nz uh, where you should find a link there somewhere. You can click onto that. Otherwise, um, you can find us on Facebook, Operation Good Oil, or Telegram, um, or your own uh, website. I think you said you're going to put a link to it as well. So Definitely on Free yeah. NZ. And, and we're trying to encourage a lot of people at the moment to go off Facebook, actually, to go on to yeah. Telegram or to go on to Rumble, go off YouTube as well, because of the deep censorship that we think is inspired by this government, pushed by this government. So, yeah, Telegram's a good one. Telegram, yep. Getter as well, G-E-T-T-R. More and more people are getting onto that as well, just to get away from the, um, you know, the equal tyranny of Facebook shutting us down and our free voice. Um, can we please donate money to you if we want to? Could we put up a site, perhaps even a, a grab a coffee, something like that for you both so that you can keep doing this valuable work? Would that be something you'd let us do? Or do you have an account number we could, we could ask people to put some money into? I have such inordinate respect for two Kiwis who would put this much effort in to help their fellow Kiwis. I'm personally not comfortable with taking money. Um, I'm currently uh, gainfully employed. So um, I, I don't ask for money for anything I do. I never have. Um, I'm not sure if David would, but I think at, at, at the, current, um, the current juncture where we are with Operation Good Oil, we, don't, we won't be taking any donations. Um, we may start selling some T-shirts or something in the future. Um, yeah, I'd buy a T-shirt like the one David's wearing. Yeah, money just um, gets so messy, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we'd rather just continue... Well, I, I personally would rather just continue as I am. David, it, it, and here you are, David, recording all these ships and trying to get information from this utterly opaque government that won't share anything, and you are doing the work. I just, it, I, I just haven't um, seen, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, but yeah, I'm just the same uh, opinion as Levi, you know. I started off doing this with, you know, in my mind, uh, you know, and I, I need to get this going. I care for the people of New Zealand, you know, and I thought, 
that's enough. You know, that's that's good enough for me. You know. And I'll tell you what, the people of New Zealand will deeply, deeply care for both of you, especially after today's talk. I am so impressed with you guys. I'm so impressed with what you've done. Please keep in touch with me and however we can help at Free NZ to keep this going and keep your information going out there. Just let us know. I thank you both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Elizabeth. Awesome. Awesome to see you again. Really good.